We got a great show for you today. We're going to break down the numbers behind rookie quarterback performances and can you trust their wide receivers in year one? We're also going to answer a ton of your questions, some debate on being a commissioner with an iron fist and a whole lot more. Make sure you subscribe and enjoy. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Ah, welcome in. The Fantasy Footballers Podcast, Thursday, May 30th. Mike Wright, Jason Moore. I'm Andy Holloway. The final episode before the Ultimate Draft Kit is released to the world, which we release it very much like an animal out into the wild. It's caged. It's been caged up mm-hmm. for a while. Yep. And then now we take it out to the... You know the open plains, and we release it. It's it's oh okay. It's much Why more. You, I mean, I, I don't look when you release an animal from a cage. There's a lot of different directions that the direction that can go. That I think that the UDK goes is full Jurassic Park. We're, you <laughs> See, know that's what, I mean? what I'm saying. We're we're we're, we're turning the power off. Is this and a, just letting people go? Just get they eaten didn't by release this thing. the dinosaurs on purpose. Yeah, in but that we're, movie. Do, we're doing. Are that. we releasing a lion or are we releasing like a a small bird? I see. It's a lion. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you going to rip your face off? That's we, right. We put it up and we run. And we just <laughs> let it do what it's going to do. Okay. But uh, <laughs> uh, that will be Saturday, June 1st, the ultimate draft kit, all our tier-based rankings, all the premium stat projections. We just completed the recording of 100-plus video player profiles. So we dive into just like uh, a brief three, four-minute overviews of our perspective on the top 100 players in the game. Those are extremely valuable. If if you haven't watched those before, because I know you, there's a lot of stuff in the UDK. So you got the UDK before, and maybe you've never really watched those. We've got like one video where you can watch them all together. I think they're extremely valuable. I learn a lot doing it. I think you'll learn a lot uh, li- watching it or listening. We have the custom cheat sheets, so you can import your league scoring settings, print out cheat sheets if you like to do that. I'm still a cheat sheet guy. I prefer to do it on paper um, at the draft, but we have the app and we have the web interface where you can mark players, which you can do that and use the cheat sheet, but you can just use the app to actually follow along with uh, who's drafted, mark them drafted, uh, which players you want to stay away from. We all have, we've gotten together and uh, we've figured out some sleepers, some breakouts, some values and busts that we all agree on. And uh, there's a whole lot more consistency charts. And uh, like you said, the mobile app, risk and upside, and a ton of tools like market share, target share, strength of schedule. And that's all part of the regular UDK that comes out on June 1st. You got one more day to get it pre-order pricing, and then boom, blam, it's out. At order price. At the, full, at the lion's out the cage. <laughs> UltimateDraftKid.com for that. This was our last show before it's released, so we wanted to draw your attention there. And um, the quick question, I'm going to throw the question out there, but it's kind of more of a discussion. Okay. Uh, The question is just, should I trust rookie quarterbacks? No. Uh Uh-uh. Okay. So, I mean, they're valuable. Nice and quick. That's the default reaction. And so I, I thought that I would do a little digging, look at the numbers. We had an article that came out around this topic back in 2018. It's not 2018 anymore. It's been a while. We've had a number of new rookie quarterbacks come into the landscape. So I want to share the data that I have uh, mined Mm -hmm. and just get your reactions to it because, you know, Caleb Williams is going to start this year, number one overall pick in the draft. Last year we had Stroud. We had Bryce Young. Um, We always talk about Herbert's great rookie year, but then you have other players that struggle. So we've bantered all around this topic, uh, talking about the upside, the downside. So I wanted to look. Here's some information for you. There are there have been 28 quarterbacks drafted inside the top 10 picks since the 2010 season. So 13 years, okay. 28 quarterbacks within the top 10 picks. That is 
10 of the 28 quarterbacks have been the number one overall pick in that span. So three years, there wasn't a quarterback drafted number one overall. The rest of those years, we had a quarterback go number one. So when you look at the data, some interesting things. In the last 13 years across 28 rookie quarterbacks, only three receivers out of 30 that I looked at reached a 100 reception plateau. It's not great. So three of 30 hit 100. It was Reggie Wayne. Makes sense. All with the Andrew Luck. With Andrew Luck. Yeah, okay. It was Keenan Allen. Okay, with Herbert. And it was Adam Thielen. So that is, a, which was last year, by the way. Right. Last year with Bryce Young. I remember. <laughs> so, I'm old enough to remember when I caught 100 passes from Bryce Young. <laughs> so uh, don't laugh that much, Al. You laugh it's, way too hard at that joke. The bit is too good. The bit is fine, What's but the Al bit? finds it so funny. The, the problem is, Jason, you needed to go with, what? <laughs> I, I don't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's 11%. By the way, wait. Adam Thielen with Bryce Young was one of those three. He was one of the three. That feels so wrong. Wait, so that's eleven percent. One hundred receptions. That's a that's a strong. Oh, that's a great amount. great number. So, but that's only eleven percent of the receivers that I looked at. Okay. Um, in the last thirteen years across the twenty-eight rookie quarterbacks, only seven of the thirty eclipsed a thousand yards. And that is a That's much, 25%. much more achievable number than 100 receptions. Which, by the way, one of those was Delaney Walker with Marcus Mariota, so a tight end. So I, I basically looked at the quarterbacks drafted in the top 10. I looked at who their top receivers were. Sometimes I considered just one of them. Sometimes I, if the reception totals were close, I'd look at more than one. Sure. Um, you know, for example, Jake Locker was one of the guys in 2011, and his top receiver was, can you even guess? Wait, Jake Locker, so the I Titans. I mean, you won't guess, but try. Was that – wait. Kenny Britt? <laughs> Kenny Britt was the no, no, no. guess. Oh, that, uh, Kenny Britt actually was in this sample, 2016 Jared Goff, threw it to Kenny Britt. Kenny Britt had, Kenny Britt had 1,002 yards. For Jake Locker, it was Nate Washington. Oh, yeah. Who actually had 1,000 yeah. yards Nate and Washington. seven touchdowns for Jake Locker as a rookie. Okay. And so um, here's the average. Here's the average – uh, the leading receiver for a rookie quarterback in that span, they averaged 69 receptions. You nice. can make a sound if you want. Mm -hmm. 837 yards, 4.3 touchdowns. Are you, I'm assuming, very not very pleased with those? No, 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 you're not very pleased. I, I, I think this is really what it is, is if you want to make a generic bet, if you want to just not look at the specifics, a bet against a rookie quarterback is a good idea. If you're looking at pass catchers, um, if you're looking at the rookie quarterback's own fantasy finish, you want to universally, you know, the odds are against it working out. But on a case-by-case -case well, basis. Let me give you more data. Okay. Because there's more to consume here. That's the average if you look at the top 10 quarterbacks. But if you take the number one overall picks, which is 10 of the 28 in that, in that sample, which is what we're talking about with mm -hmm. Caleb Williams, it's a lot more intriguing. If you were a number one overall pick, your leading receiver – Put up eighty two for a thousand and eleven and four. So your numbers were a thousand. Okay, a thousand. Like I was so confused. One thousand eleven yards. Correct. Okay, because it so sounded like one thousand and eleven, 11 and then I was like, "What's the four? <laughs> so like four fumbles? <laughs> it jumps from sixty nine receptions and eight hundred thirty seven yards to eighty two and over a thousand. So if you were not in the overall number one pick, it goes down to sixty three for seven sixty nine and four. So if you were the overall number one pick, you have a much better chance of producing a receiver that puts up 82 for 1,004. Now, no quarterback, no rookie ever in that sample has put up a double-digit di double touchdown score. Okay. So there's been zero. So nobody's ever scored double-digit touchdowns, so your odds, DJ Moore, of double digits are not there. The issue, the yardage can come for rookie quarterbacks easier, and and – they they don't come a lot. There's not a bunch of people that have thrown for 4,000 yards as rookie quarterback. But the real issue is touchdown passes from rookie quarterbacks. You know, the, the line right now for Caleb Williams is 23 and a half. And so you're like, okay, if you want to go over that, he throws 24 touchdowns. He's in elite company. I think there's only three guys three. that have ever yep. done it. Um, and those three guys, Justin Herbert had his great rookie season. 
Um, you had Baker Mayfield yeah. with his really good rookie season, and then the, and <laughs> and uh, it's Daniel Jones, believe it or not, who got to twenty four. But like it, it barely ever happens to so. When you're looking at the receivers, touchdowns, I think you've got to be weary of that. The touchdown numbers have just never been supported in high amounts. Now, the other thing that I noticed from the sample is that the majority of all these rookie quarterbacks, whether you're the first pick or the top 10, you're throwing to garbage receivers more often than not. The yep. number one receivers in this list, it's Brian Hartline, it's uh, Kendall Wright, it was Zay Jones one year, it was Robbie Anderson, it was Devontae Parker, it was Jameson Crowder, it was Alan Hearns. And the ones that did produce were the guys that had careers that already were worthy of production. Reggie like Wayne. Reggie Wayne. Steve Smith, he went for 79, 13, 94, and 7. That was a That's dominant awesome. season. Reggie Wayne, 106 for 13, five, uh, 1355. Delaney Walker was 94 for 1088 with Marcus Mariota, which is wild. But And Keenan, 100 for 992. Right. But if you – you know, most of the time these rookie quarterbacks come into a situation where they don't have the receiving core that you would hope for. It's a little bit interesting this year because all of that data, like Caleb Williams, you know the number for the leading receiver for number one picks in the last 13 years is 82 for 1,004. Mm -hmm. And he also has guys that have done it. Keenan Allen was one of the ones that was an example, but DJ Moore did it last year. So, you know, basically it looks like rookie quarterbacks can support top-tier seasons from top-tier players. If they're the number one overall pick. Right. But they also then need a really hyper focused target share. And that's that's like where the Caleb Williams thing sure. becomes even more interesting to me. Because if it, it's Caleb Williams and DJ Moore, and then they draft Romo Dunze. Like that's it going forward. Okay. Maybe DJ Moore maintains his insane target share that he had last year. But you have two true number one wide receivers, so I mean, how are they both going to push the target share number that you need from – because you need the targets from the quarterback of, you know, with a little bit more inexperienced, a little more inaccurate, things of those things. So you need an inflated target share to get to those numbers. Especially so, because rookie touchdowns aren't there. Yeah. Rookie and, and, quarterback yes, touchdowns And historically there. the touchdowns haven't been there. So it's how does that split for Chicago – how does it – really shake up we've never we've never seen it i mean that's one of the things you know when you talk about some of these research um pieces you're already dealing with a small sample size but we don't have another sample like reggie wayne was awesome with andrew luck right but there wasn't the the number two wide receiver that year was donnie avery they, they did have ty hilton but he was a rookie that was rookie year ty hilton so right um it was reggie wayne and 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 nobody steve smith i don't i don't remember who the number two wide receiver was um, that year for rookie Cam Newton, but like Steve Smith was the guy. So it will be so interesting. You've got a legit prospect coming into, you know, at least two great wide receivers, and you hope three. And you hope for a pass-heavy offense, and you don't know if Roma Dunze is going to factor in in a big way target share-wise in rookie season. So it should be it should be pretty interesting. I have the wide receiver, too, for that Carolina Panther team, Jason. Oh, great. Wait, wait, wait. Can Andy guess it? I know I can't. I thought. I'm trying to. It's a name you know, but I don't know that you're going to guess this one. And it's not Greg Olson because he was third on the team with 540 yards. Muhammad? What was his name? Muhammad Sanu? No. Mush, Mushi Muhammad? No. It was Brandon LaFell. Okay. Wouldn't have got there. Yeah, yeah see, exactly. I mean, that's like, the point. That, that's like, a name that's Oh, by the, the way, that was the right name for a Panthers wide receiver, Mushin Muhammad. You guys don't remember him? Uh, vaguely. The name's in the mm. back of the head okay. somewhere. All right. Yeah, so uh, so there you go. I mean, we. The hard, okay, what so Jason th said is the hardest thing is very, very limited sample size of these situations. Sure. Uh, but so after you have done the, the deep dive here statistically, how do you feel about – like how, DJ Moore, you, you've been – over the offseason, you've kind of been pretty bullish. Do you still feel – that's I still feel pretty it? bullish about DJ Moore. Okay, but it didn't really move me too much. Okay, on Caleb Williams specifically, but that's because of what I believe about the target share and the roles. Like, if you, I mean, it's tough. Like, Keenan Allen and DJ Moore are just fundamentally different wide receivers. Yeah, and it's not like you're splitting the same kinds of targets down the field. So it does come down to Roma Dunze's involvement, and you know there are some people that think he's not ready at all. 
And there are some people that think he's going to make an immediate impact. And that will make a big difference. Um, so I, I don't know if that changes any of the opinions. We All of our data before had been just like rookie quarterbacks that were drafted anywhere in the first round or played 10 or more starts. Not a lot of data that we had in our, in our old article about top 10 or number one overall. Top specifically. 10, yeah. So then I uh, would – did that shift how you – think about Terry McLaurin at all since he'll have Jaden Daniels yeah I mean it's I think the major point here is that you're not going to get big touchdown totals we know that on both sides we know it on the receiver side you don't even luck into double digits and we know it on the quarterback side with what you guys said about Daniel Jones and um, Baker, Baker, and, Baker and, and Herbert so I mean like your odds are low for those things to happen so you're having to make a really really big bet and then like McLaurin does he have a history of double digit touchdowns no so yeah I I don't know if I was very high on the prospects there okay. anyways, but but yeah, it, it puts some doubt. I mean, Drake May with Jalen Polk, what he's got to be able to do, how much of a target share there, that puts some question in my mind. I mean, I don't know if it does for you. Uh, my expectations for Polk are – they're not necessarily high. It's more of a – been talking about his value compared to other wide receivers in rookie drafts of this guy is – For longer a, term. Yeah, this guy's a starter. We yeah. won. Yeah, so – um We'll find out. Caleb will put it on display this year, as will Daniels and May, and um, we'll get to see some more numbers added to the stats. News and notes from around the league. Well, Nico Collins, who was the byproduct of a rookie quarterback oh, last that, year. Do we got that drop anywhere? Are you talking about this one? Yeah. Yeah. Nico. I noticed that drop, it never accumulates on the screen. Because right? it's filling up for a us, giant pit on for the us bottom. To grab. Um, <laughs> so Nico Collins, three year, seventy two million dollar extension, thirty two million guaranteed at signing. This is a big, big deal for Nico Collins for CJ Stroud over the next couple of years. Uh he's going to have Nico and Tank Dell. Mm -hmm. And it was a huge year for Nico last season. Does it make you feel like Stephon Diggs is a rental? Like from a dynasty perspective, do you see the – like what, what What would you put the odds? Now that you know that Tank and Nico are locked in, they're long-term, they're they're sitting there with Stroud. But, but Tank is very cheap. Yeah, and, that's and Tank, Tank is cheap. Stroud is cheap comparatively because he's on his rookie deal. So I don't – I, I think it's probably a rental, but if, if Stephon Diggs shows up and you're like – and all the fears of him being washed are gone – then I think that they sign him. They give him a, a tour. They time it up so that he's kind of off the books as they're having to pay Stroud or Tank. DeAndre Hopkins is going to play his second season in Tennessee this year. That could happen with Stephon Diggs in Houston yeah. next year. But you're talking about Diggs is going to turn 31 this season. He'll be 32 middle middle of the way through next season. Yeah. So the, him being a temporary asset is not a – What about the season a, after that? He'll be 33. What? Keep going. What? 34. What? Yeah. Yeah. Hold on, hold and, on, and so hold on, on. Wow. and counting as Mike would say. Yeah, um, but so so I mean, I think Diggs, whether it's a one year rental or not, he is a depreciating asset. Agree. Yes, and this is this is great news for Nico. I mean, Nico from a dynasty perspective, I didn't know what to do with him. Ironically, we had a dynasty show come out yesterday, which we recorded about two hours before the news <laughs> right. broke and I was talking about like there there's still the concern for me for Nico long term that he doesn't have a, a a deal signed man this offense I I just don't see how it doesn't work it's gonna be and exciting. that's exactly what fantasy football does it sets you up to knock you down yeah <laughs> hey welcome to Cleveland Browns offense Jarvis Landry Odell Beckham Jr. Baker Mayfield coming in off of the best rookie run you've ever seen touchdown wise mm-hmm Hard to not see comparisons between those. I I do have the Baker Mayfield feel make Baker <laughs> Mayfield fears <laughs> field and fears. No, I keep saying them as the same word. <laughs> yeah, but it's it, it is very difficult right now. Or maybe you didn't even play fantasy when Baker Mayfield had his rookie year. Going into year two, he was outrageously high. He was as high as. C.J. Stroud is right now in Dynasty. He was like the quarterback four off the board, and, and he was the future. He was a guaranteed, awesome, next great first ballot Hall of Famer. And you have three wide receivers, Mike, Diggs, 
Nico, Tank Dell, all being drafted inside the top 25. There's going to be something wrong with that. Probably, yeah. They're like in the top 25. And if there's not, then C.J. Stroud's a top three guy. Like you, you can't really have a world where C.J. Stroud maybe can support three top 25. I mean, if you if you look back in history at the teams where you did support three top options, which has happened before, those are Aaron Rodgers when he was the number one or number two quarterback, Peyton Manning when he was you know the number one or yeah. number three quarterback. It, I think Andy's right. If all three guys hit on their ADP, then Stroud is to the moon. Which is probably why we're saying like one of these guys isn't going to work out. I think the three of us all feel like Diggs is the maybe. Just last year, the wide receiver twenty five was Jacoby Myers, who had seventy one for eight hundred and eight touchdowns. Like if that's one of the that's, three, but it, that would be the third. Yeah, but it's just, it it touchdowns, touchdowns all the matter. If I could quickly do the math on the wide receiver fourteen, fifteen, and twenty five numbers from last year, and what that would mean at a minimum for Stroud. That would be interesting, but because that's where they're going. It would be uh, – so Ayuk was 14, Debo was 15. That's 14 total touchdowns plus Jacoby at eight. So that's that's still not getting you up to the echelon that we need. No, but that's 22 among three players. That's wild. Yeah. Get a little Schultz in there. Mix a little mixing in. Don't forget about Bobby Trees still on the roster. He's still on the roster. I believe oh, so. Oh, Debo had <laughs> rushing touchdowns, though. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. A little, a little cheaty. All right. All right. Well, there you go. Nico Collins. I honestly feel like Nico is – do you feel like he's the safest of the three? I feel I, like with this deal, he's now the safest of the three. I, I The only the only reason he wouldn't be the safest is because he – because of average draft position right now, he's up at like wide receiver 15, whereas Tank Dell's down at 25. Um, but, you know, you don't deal with the injury with Nico. You, you already have the rapport established. And I do think that Diggs coming in, this doesn't – like uh, uh, there is part of it where it's like, okay, well, you can't throw it to everyone at the same play, so the target share goes down. But also, you can't defend these guys. Who are you, Well, Noah Brown had huge years exactly. last year. Exactly. He huge, had huge massive games. years. Huge years. The <laughs> biggest years you ever It was like see. a dog year for Noah Brown. So um, he had seven of them last season. And uh, – you think that this kind of speech impediments that we have will continue the older we get? No, I'm sure our Baker brains are Baker Mayfield. Sharp, sharper and sharper. But, uh, but no, Noah Brown had monster games. Yeah, and they were down the field when things opened up, and you saw that with Nico. Schultz I, got the bag, though, too. Yeah, I man, I think Nico is going to have a monster season. I would, I'd be most worried about Tank Dale coming off of injury plus the offseason incident mixed with Diggs. Like, I love Tank Dell. I think he's a great player. But I could see him having the uh, occasional letdown if Diggs is still the guy. Sure. Unfortunately. Um, any other news to get into? Nope. No, sir. No? Nothing else? All right. Let's take a break. Come back with some questions. I definitely think you should go and check out the Dynasty podcast that these guys recorded um, yesterday, mostly because Jason time warps inside the episode, <laughs> and that's, that's all I'm going to yeah, say. That was a fun. That was a fun time warp. Jason. Jason went through some things. You talk about Noah Brown having a bunch of years. Yeah. Jason threw some in. Uh, mailbag time. Mailbag. mailbag yeah. Get the UDK. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, if you have a question for the that? show, <laughs> who said that? <laughs> Visit the website, thefantasyfootballers.com, where you can find the UDK, but also the submit a question button, or you can dial our voicemail hotline, send in a question that way, 302-464-TFFB. If you mess up your question on the voicemail, our producers will hear it and laugh. Yeah, and, but it'll be okay. Yeah, and... um we probably won't play it on the air at that point. Uh, we do have a voicemail question. We're going to kick it off. Brandon from Kentucky has a dynasty question. Hey, this is Brandon from Kentucky. Uh, thanks for everything See? you do for the show. Uh, but I was wondering in a dynasty uh, one quarterback PPR format, would you trade AJ Brown straight up for Jonathan Taylor? Thanks guys. Uh, I will jump in. So the question was, this is Dynasty. A.J. Brown straight up for Jonathan Taylor. A.J. Brown's about to be 27. 
Jonathan Taylor will be turning 26 this year, and I I would not. I I can understand that that's kind of the value of of what it would take to get Jonathan Taylor. He's a pretty hot commodity at the running back position, a little harder to find. But A.J. Brown with the new deal. Yeah, there's no way. And him being locked in as – like he's – A.J. Brown to me is just outside of my tier one – Dynasty wide receivers, which are Chase Jefferson. Um, well, now I'm losing Amon Ra and Ceedee Lamb. Those are the four. Like that, they're at the top to me. And AJ Brown's just right behind there. After the 2025 season, Jonathan Taylor will be older, looking for a new contract. All of that. Um, really? Did he just got a he just, got he, paid. just he just got paid. He just got paid. And after that season, he has a two million dollar dead cap. If they wanted to get out before the 2026 season. Oh, okay. Oh, you're That's saying his, after next year? Yes, not this year. After next year. Okay. Comparatively. Because both these guys just got a new contract. A.J. Brown did, and Jonathan Taylor did. Uh, after the 2025 season, it would be a $20 million dead cap for A.J. Brown. In fact, the dead cap goes all the way down through 2028. So this is like... Oh, it's, it's longevity. Yeah, yeah it's in longevity. A, in a vacuum, I'm not doing it. The longevity argument aside, I wouldn't do it. But if I had two of the other top 10 dynasty wideouts and I'm, I need a, a running back, then then you can make that decision. Like, if you want to make a run for the title, I mean, I think there are people out there that would trade uh, A.J. Brown to get Christian McCaffrey for two years I mean, obviously, to try to run for a title. So I, I, I do see a little bit of logic if, if you're super deep at running back or at wide, uh, receiver. wide receiver, then maybe you'd consider it. But I, in a vacuum, I think we'd all say no. Correct. Uh, Drew Gold writes in off of Instagram with a question. Who has a better 2024 year, Kirk Cousins or... The aforementioned Caleb Williams. The timing of the discussion is on point. And, man, if, if that's where you're going, like that low in the barrel for fantasy quarterbacks, we're talking redraft. I mean, I, or whatever. It doesn't even matter. Uh, redraft or dynasty. I'm going Caleb here. I'm going to take the shot of the upside because of all the things we laid out of. Like, this is a number one overall pick who – we we don't have comps for what Caleb Williams is walking into. Uh, yes, he's never thrown in the NFL. Could be a colossal disaster. But Kirk Cousins has the Achilles injury, which he's – yes, he's on the field and still throwing and all of those things, but there's a big difference between guys are not allowed to breathe on you in OTAs to – 250 pound men coming to take your does life it, away from you. Does it make a difference to you at all? Uh, eighth round for Caleb, 12th round for Kirk. Like, are those both long, you know, far enough back where you're just like, give me the upside of Caleb? Yeah, I think so. Are uh, you on that side, Jason? Uh, so I'm, I am definitely on the side that the, the round and the ADP doesn't really matter. The guys going in the eighth round, you know, DeAndre Hopkins or, um, Javante Williams, like you're not sacrificing so much that if you believe in Caleb Williams and his ceiling well over Kirk Cousins, then yeah, the 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 savings doesn't matter there. But I'm I'm on the side that I think Kirk Cousins has a better 2024. You know, in in order to be successful, you you need 4,000 plus yards, you need 30 plus touchdowns. Kirk Cousins is Kirk Cousins has done that several times. He has been very good. You know, he can do it. And if you look historically, like for instance, over 4,000 yards, very few quarterbacks have ever done it. Over 24 passing touchdowns, very few Rookies. rookie quarterbacks have ever done it. One guy did both of them, Justin Herbert. Yeah. He did both. He crushed. He had basically the best rookie quarterback season for a non, you know, Cam Newton, uh, mobile rushing quarterback style. Um, and he was the quarterback eight. So it's like, is. Yeah, they, if that's your ceiling is quarterback eight. The, the biggest problem is not the Cousins versus Williams. It's the fact that Purdy, Daniels, Tua, Goff, Lawrence, and Herbert are in between those two guys in the draft. If I'm sitting Caleb Williams at, at the end of the eighth round or Brock Purdy in the middle of the ninth mm -hmm. or Jared Goff in the middle of in the late tenth or the Herbert uh, situation that you just brought up in the eleventh, that's when my decision gets more difficult. It wouldn't be – like I'd rather – I just would rather have Caleb Williams and see what happens than Kirk Cousins. Sure, I, I'm I'm fine with that. I do agree with you. Like Brock Purdy, Justin Herbert, uh, Tua, I would rather have all of those guys. YouTube question coming in from Bobby. He says, how much does injury potential influence your rankings? If a player is injury prone, how are your rankings impacted 
compared to a similar player that does not have an injury history? Uh, this is a good question. I, I would start it off by saying I think that very there's very few players in the NFL where I actually say that's an injury-prone player. Like even I mean, Keenan Allen had that label. Christian McCaffrey would definitely have had that label after the two missed years that he had. And now he, and since that time, he's been an Iron Man. So it's it's pretty rare. Like Christian Watson, for an yeah, example. That, Christian Watson, I'm like, I think that guy has a really bad injury problem so much that they're spending the offseason trying to figure out why he has an injury problem. I brought so, up – I tried to tease Jason with, like, what does a Kyron Williams, Brees Hall trade look like in our league of record? We we have those two guys on our keepers, uh, on our rosters. And Jason's first reaction is it'd be pretty hard. Kyron has this offseason injury report. Now, it's May 29th. It shouldn't be in the back of your head, but you don't want to know why it is? It's because he was hurt last year. Yeah. So I think it does have a psychological influence in the way you look at it because you're like, well, I shouldn't think about about that but what if yeah I, but as far as how it affects our rankings when we stat people out um there are very few players and there are a there are a few where i'll basically subtract the game from their actual like counting james stats. connor james connor is the name that came yep. to mind james connor will not play a full season he'll play most of the games he'll play 14 games you know he's going to be good on a per game basis but he just will always miss a couple games because of his play style and history um but for the most part, that all goes into our risk rating. So if you're looking at our rankings and you want to know, like, well, you know, who is someone that we are concerned about, look at that risk rating number because that's where we will, you know, put that into, like, this this player might be here in the rankings, but he is a risky pick. But for the most part, we try to not um, double count injuries and, yep. and, and overdo them because we've done this long enough to know that, there are some injury-prone labels. Frank Gore is the Iron Man of all Iron Men. He was known as someone that was just a complete and utter injury risk. Every year, the first couple years of his career, he was just never able to stay on the field, and then he played until he had grandchildren. Now, I will say the follow-up to that then is injuries that are happening in training camp. Yes. when like Especially soft tissue. You're talking someone's like, ooh, they're going to miss the rest of camp with a hamstring injury. That will create a dip in the ADP market. It's always tantalizing. Don't of, do it. Of the, oh, this player that should have cost me a fourth-round pick, I'm getting him in the eighth round now? Those we have found taking <laughs> taking the risk of the training camp hamstring injury, those, those can bite you. I spent a couple years in a row – writing down at the right at kickoff I would write down all the players that like you know who really struggled who was the injury dip players who had a training camp injury or wasn't quite ready or they should be ready but for week one and at the end of the year I would look and see okay how did how did those fare and there's always one or two that works out yeah but it's like eight or nine that don't it's just a bad bet don't buy the injury dips don't tell me what to do. If I want to buy a dip, Jason, <laughs> I, I could be know. I could be the outlier. I didn't know you Don't were even you know listening. That? I wasn't you talking to you, brother. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. uh, YouTube question, will Jameer Gibbs have a true breakout season? Or will he share a chunk of time again with another support back? Both. Um, Both. I mean, some might say that the breakout happened from week seven on last year where he was the RB3. But uh, that also included. The cheap suit 1743, that was not a true breakout. Well, I think uh, maybe classifying it as a dominant year from start to finish. Uh, Jason said both. I'm with that. I, I, David Monk be, how many times this year will you be frustrated with David Montgomery as the Jameer Gibbs manager? Ten. Ten? Well, just because I think David Montgomery has ten touchdowns. And so every time he scores, you'll be 100%. It doesn't matter. If you've got Jameer Gibbs and he has three touchdowns and 200 yards in that game and David Montgomery comes in and gets that yeah. fourth touchdown, you're yeah. going to be pissed. Yeah. I know because we've been there. We're selfish. We, we <laughs> Oh, want, my gosh. Mike of all Mike people. Mike is the worst. Mike with, the with worst. Christian McCaffrey. <laughs> he had like a five-touchdown game. And, you, and like, you were so mad Elijah Mitchell got the last one. <laughs> But it it's uh, that just tells me you weren't rooting for Chris McCaffrey. <laughs> so last but that's year, the point. thirteen 
touchdowns for David Montgomery. But the craziest part of that stat was that he only, in the games he played, he only had three games where he didn't score a rushing touchdown. Yeah. So, like, and you're now you're two years of this in Detroit. You had Jamal Williams, who scored uh, constantly and made, what was it, DeAndre Swift managers upset? Yes. And then you've got Montgomery, who the – it wasn't just chunks. I mean, he had a three-touchdown game one time. Then it's one, 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 one. I mean, he just – he is there to bother you. Yeah. So to answer, but the snaps will go down. Yeah. The 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 for David Montgomery. Yes. Yeah. The snaps will go down. Jameer Gibbs coming into his second year will get an increase in work. I've only got him with two hundred and two carries. A lot more work in the passing game. And I've got David Montgomery with ten touchdowns. I've got this. You know, every player in the league is statted out. At the end, David Montgomery is fine. He's a fine player. And Jameer Gibbs is my running back three. That's a true monstrous breakout. I think Jameer Gibbs is an electric talent that will have rushing touchdowns, will have receiving touchdowns, will get, you know, north of 80 targets. I've got him at 92 targets. He should be a, uh, you know, a fantasy breaker. Let me give you a comp. Well, tell me if it's it, it makes any sense, but Melvin Gordon. Oh, Eckler. Eight touchdowns, 2019. In the backfield with Austin Eckler, yeah, uh, he ended up the running back twenty three in twenty nineteen. Melvin Gordon did, and Austin Eckler that year was the RB six. Yeah, and there, I there mean was that a year, seems very similar. The comp to me is like Jamal Charles had a year. I forget who the other guy was. They was had, it Thomas, was Tom, Jones? Thomas Jones. Thomas yeah, Jones. Yeah. Thomas Jones was really effective. Had a lot of rushing touchdowns. But when you've got the we're juice, bringing up Thomas Jones. All right, go go Alvin Kamara and um, <laughs> yeah, and Mark, and Ingram. Mark Ingram. There, you, Are you okay this, with that, Mike? Yes, yes, I am. <laughs> Thomas Jones. Well, Jamal Charles, Thomas the, Jones, they the, existed together. The reason Thomas Jones is being brought up Don't is, because started of, on Garrison Hurst. is because of Jamal <laughs> Charles. Because even though uh, I loved uh, Alvin Kamara, even as a rookie, he was great. Um, not the same type of player. I, I see a lot of Jamal Charles type of, you know, action oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. in Gibbs where you just, you do not, if you're a, def, if you're a defense, don't let him get space because he gone. He's just over. Well, let me let me ask this question here. Nick Bryant wants to know, and it's a it's a big question. I think there's lots of opinions. What are your feelings on Will Levis for fantasy this year? Um, I, I'm pretty sure Kyle wrote his mantra in here, which he refers to it as chuck it deep <laughs> or get rocked. <laughs> I, like, I like to think that every snap he, he like said it. And right before he says hike in his brain, he goes, it's Levis time. <laughs> Banana-rama. Banana-rama. Look, I, I'm i rooting for Will Levis. I'm going yes. to put it that way. I'm not projecting something special, but I'm rooting for him. He's got weapons. Uh, for fantasy this year, I think I think there'll be three times you'll, you'll stream him. I love the idea of taking a shot on Will Levis. Not because... I expect it to pay off. Will Levis is a parlay. Okay, that is what Will Levis is this season. Parlays don't usually hit, right? You you know, you build this like, oh, it's got three, five legs. I got I to gotta have all these things yeah. go right. But if they go right, that's going to be a payoff. And that's how I see Will Levis. Like, I don't expect it to go right, but I see that it, if it goes right, if Will Levis hits with, with Calvin Ridley and DeAndre Hopkins and – uh, even Tyler Boyd now added to the mix. Tajay Sharp out of the backfield. The the rushing ability. He should be. He should have four or five rushing touchdowns as well. If it hits in his year two, you know that's that five dollar parlay that makes you a grand. And sure. so it's like because it costs you nothing. It, Will Levis is a nineteenth round ADP. He's not drafted. Even in two quarterback leagues, you know he's he is super late. So I like taking the shot. It. it the 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 risk is worth the reward because there is almost no risk. All right, I I got I got to take a break and then come back and I'm aghast over here. <laughs> oh, I hear that. Okay. All right. So the next question we had we had some people write in questions about um, I guess you'd call them. Homer callouts. Okay. Worried that we're ranking certain Cardinal players oh. inappropriately. Okay. The first question comes from Jay Brittle4, who says, Did you guys overrate Trey McBride? 
I have obviously, I mean, we've talked about Trey McBride. I do believe that you guys overrate Trey McBride. However, Mike, do you know where you have him right now? I do. And and do you know you, where my where Trey McBride is on Mike's yep, list? Yep, I see it. But I'm just saying, when you say you guys over over emphasize Trey McBride, you're speaking of Mike and I. I well, have him I, lower no, I, than you. I see his ranking on your list. I see him at five now. Yeah, right now we're competing. Who has Trey McBride the lowest or the highest? Depends on what side you want. Or to the be most on. reasonable. Um, yeah, the answer is for Mike, yes, and me and Jason, no. Okay, is that a fair answer? That's a, well, so. To peel back the curtain, Putting Mike, you him at number one is th- we've got uh, is, a, is a is a bold call. Yeah, we got to do some explain yourself stuff here. You've oh got him gosh. as your tight end one, so yeah. explain yourself. Well, from week ten on, he was averaging nearly ten targets a game. Mm-hmm. If you're looking at yards per route run last year, there were uh, two starting tight ends who averaged more than two yards per route run. That would be Travis Kelsey, heard of him, and Trey McBride. Uh, look, I get Marvin Harrison is in this. So spot. David Njoku is your number one then? N- no, he wasn't in that. I didn't say Wait, David Njoku. Why? Did, why are you bringing up yeah. Njoku? Oh, just because his end of season was so good that you should just project it. For it the rest wasn't of his just career. he it was number one tight end. Wasn't just end of season. And look, well, you look, you put Njoku. It, it, it was bigger than Njoku. It was less time than Njoku's run. Njoku had a longer run. Okay, well, you put Joe Flacco as a starting quarterback instead of uh, Voldemort. Maybe I'm more into David Njoku. But like he's going into his third year, the bro the, the breakout happened for him. He's still a young guy. Uh, he's hitting that age in the like in the in the world of the tight end. He is approaching the age where these guys start to really peak, and he already broke out. And I think that the offense revolves around Marvin Harrison Jr. and Trey McBride. Uh, it, and for, it will it will revolve yeah, around those two guys. And for for all of the hopes and dreams of like well put Marvin into the Hall of Fame already. He's still a rookie rookie wide receiver and even if he is incredibly great. The offense can be those two guys and be hyper focal or hyper focused onto them and I see that Trey McBride is going to have a whole bunch of receptions and I just need that the the touchdowns to go up a little bit. Yeah, he's absolutely in the conversation. You, you I think there are five tight ends this year that legitimately could be the number 1 tight end. So he's he is my five. But as far as answering the question, did we overrate McBride? Are we too high because we're homers? Trey McBride's ADP, his average draft right now on um, both underdog and sleeper, he's the tight end three going off the board. Consensus, he's our tight end four. So no, we're not we're, we're not uh, Arizonaing him. Well, here's the inverse question from Jordan: Is it is it me, or do you guys have a big bias against Hollywood Brown now that he failed in Arizona? Because they think we have Hollywood ranked far too low, um, which ADP wise, this one's legit. This, so this is legit. Maybe. No, well, <laughs> here's where I'm saying. Here's why I'm saying it's somewhat legit. I think because we care so much about you know the Arizona Cardinals, we you know right. we, we we root, we watch it, we we watch every snap of every game. We try, but it's impossible right. when there's so many games going on. We saw Hollywood suck. Like he was bad. He yes. was. He was. He did not look the same. And th- and if you've listened to the show for a long time, I I have loved Hollywood well before he was a Cardinal. Loved him coming out of college. Loved him as a Raven. Um, he was not the same dude last year. Now he dealt with a heel injury. Maybe that's all over. We've talked about that before. Wait, do we need to update that yeah, jersey again? Yeah, every year you got to update it because no one wants Hollywood Brown. <laughs> it's red. <laughs> you know, like it's still Chiefs color. Um, but yes, we saw a lot of him. I, so I think so that it, does influence, but it's not necessarily a negative thing. That could be a positive thing that we got to see a lot of him, and we aren't convinced that he's going to go out there and and play in the system the way that you know a lot of people hope. Being that he's Patrick Mahomes' guy, he's also one of the players that I'm reserving some significant adjustment for, based on the way training camp looks. And the depth chart and how long Rashi Rice is out. Yeah, like, Rice like, matters. Like, um, it, it's just one of those things where you don't see a lot of success from the wide receiver, too, if he is indeed the two on this team with Patrick Mahomes. And Hollywood, is, like, nobody wanted him. Like, the, right. he sat out on the market and he signed a one year deal. So it's like, we're, we're not the only ones seeing that. I think there are a lot of people, like, the ADP for underdog 
is irrelevant to this discussion to me because, of course, he's a great pick on underdog. Yeah. Because what if he's the one for Patrick Mahomes yeah. because Rashi Rice is out and Mahomes wants to drive the ball downfield and Hollywood's one of the best ever at well, it. So MVS and you get catches good, bomb touchdowns. Yeah, you get good games from him. But redraft-wise, I mean, Jason is literally on the mark with where redraft ADP is on the dot 39. We won't talk about Mike and I's ratings. My, mine is like he ended up where he ended up, and if you want some statistical talk about Hollywood Brown, uh, here's some stats. Since t- uh, 2020, 54 wide receivers have seen 250 or more targets, and of those 54 in fantasy points per target, he is 46th. So, What, what are some a, of the names around a, him? On a per-target basis. These are the fantasy points per target you would expect. Hollywood Brown is around Allen Robinson, Michael Gallup, Chase Claypool, Robert Woods. Like it hasn't it it has not worked in his time in the NFL. I want to yeah, go ahead. I was just it, it's like if they if they don't draft Xavier Worthy in the first round, talking about the Kansas City Chiefs. I'm a, I'm a little more optimistic and just the cross your fingers and hope for Hollywood Brown. But I don't think that he when, – when they're fully healthy and ready to go, Rasheed Rice is there, Kelsey's there, Worthy is there. I think that, that Brown I mean, is a bit part on the offense. The odds of him being MBS are not zero. They're very high. Like that could literally be what he is. Mm-hmm. I want to circle back to McBride. I want to kind of – Okay. I want to take a breath. And I actually want to apologize for my for my um, what, what would you call that uh, disgust in, in, insulting maybe because I actually think I think it's beneficial to not play it safe on your ranking. So if you have a conviction about a player, I think it's the best thing you can do because that look if you're following Mike's rankings, Trey McBride will be your tight end. That's what that's the the facts because when you combine draft value. With potential outcome, you're probably going to have Trey McBride if you are on Mike's side with what he's going to do. And it doesn't really – like, we're playing to win the game. Mm-hmm. Right. So I think that ultimately, while I was surprised because I didn't know it, that's what you got. You got my – I didn't know that was the case until middle of the show. But because of that, that doesn't mean that that's a wrong ranking because if you have a conviction about a player and you do have a pile of guys that could all finish number one this year – I applaud taking the shot in rankings. I think it takes courage. Well, thank you. I like I have him down for a a twenty five percent target share. You didn't even have to use a golden ticket. I got this golden <laughs> ticket. This golden ticket from Andy. One free Andy Holloway agreement, and I'm I'm still holding on to it. I'm I'm it's, I'm gonna. The longer you go, the more scared I get. Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Now you can't use that on a my guy segment. All right. <laughs> I, you don't. You don't tell me what I can do. This is golden. I can. See, I'm not they, a, it's not a silver ticket. He makes me. Yeah, it's not he a bronze makes me ticket. say a bunch of bad stuff about my future my <laughs> yeah. guy. Yeah. Ooh, um, baby. Yeah. Well, here's a question for you, Jason. IG question from Tony the Tiger. Uh, when making league rule changes, should it be unanimous or majority rules? So I th- I think to some degree it depends on your league. There's a league that I manage where it is Iron Fist. Um, I'm the commissioner. That's how. <laughs> That's yes. not even unanimous. It's just you're an, an you authoritarian. The I'm I'm an authoritarian, <laughs> um, and that and that's fine. That's what it is. Like someone, <laughs> that's what you signed up for. Exactly. But that's my point. If that you is signed the point. up for the league where it's like I'm running it, do you want to be part of my league? I mean, I'm not like dropping players off your team and adding <laughs> them to mine. But if I if I say, hey, from we're ru- gonna from a rule standpoint, yeah. it's your league you're running. Yeah. If I say you invited I invited people into your dictatorship. If I want uh, you know, a point per first down next year, I'm gonna add it. I'm gonna let everybody know we're doing this. And that's totally fine if that's how it started and that's what you want. Most of our leagues that we play, and our main league of record is the exact we this is this is a democracy, and this is like you have to have um you have to have for any major rule change, major, we require like a super majority. Um, it doesn't have to be unanimous. You're never going to get unanimous. No, because there's always one guy. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that just doesn't want to go along with the flow. You Some know what I mean? people love saying no because it gives them power. Yeah. Do you, Jason, have any fears of your fantasy league rise, like rising up? And having a revolution. Um, I or did, a I have wondered if so, that they all like, started league with eleven. No, there was um, 
There was one guy who was making making some push. Uh oh. Took him out. Made an example of him. Took made uh. an example. Let out. Let the other ten. No, watch him. He's out of the league. No, you did not. No, I didn't. <laughs> oh, no, of okay. course I did. Okay, but I did have a situation where one one guy left the league and then found his own replacement that nobody knew, and I'm like, nope, <laughs> you're that new guy's out of the league. <laughs> so yeah. So you booted the replacement. I booted because the they were trying to be responsible. And th yeah, good for you. But you, Iron Fist League. What is the right. name of this league? Well, the, Jason's League. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the name. Um, yeah. It's just All fun. right. Um. All right, final reminder here, ultimatedraftkit.com, your last chance to get it at a pre-order price. Get the UDK Plus. You'll save even more. It releases on Saturday. We're looking forward to all of your oh feedback. Boy. Our team is hard at work. We have been- uh, We've been busting you know, our booties over here. So shout out to the whole team. Yeah. The whole fantasy footballers team. Who is to been, Mike and Andy and, and Jason. Jason. I mean, the, shout whole out team to the whole team has just been incredible. Your league must be real fun. <laughs> all right, that is going to do it. We've got uh, some fun episodes coming up, including a mock draft with all three of us, so you don't want to miss that. Take care, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.